All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's 7 p.m. and uh, we'd like to welcome you to the Fruit of City Council meeting. We're gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order at 7 p.m. Uh, Deb, would you please call roll? Councillor Buck is excused absent. Councillor Lenhart. She's remote. She's there, my, the Karen, are you, lag. are you here? For the record, Councillor Lenhart is attending remote. Can you hear us, Karen? <coughs> Karen, can you hear us? Karen? Is he talking to me? Yeah, can you can you hear us? <laughs> is she? She is here. Councilor Harvey? Here. Councilor Cry? Here. Councilor O'Brien? Here. Councilor Bremen? Here. All right, um, with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have an agenda before us. I know we, um, uh, one thing we're going to remove from our agenda is our presentation. Uh, Monument Ridge Elementary School has requested to schedule this at a later date. Is there any other changes to our agenda? No other changes to the agenda, Mr. Mayor. All right, do we have a motion? I move that we approve the agenda as amended. Yes. O'Brien? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Yes. Councillor Lenhart? Karen? Karen, we have a motion to adopt the agenda and it's been seconded and the vote has been taken. I don't think she can hear us. I don't think so. She's in Columbia, so it's it's a ways. It's not like Denver. Karen, can you hear us? Karen? John, can you message her in the chat? Yeah. Will she see the chat? I'll, I'll text her. <laughs> bear with us we thought we had all these technical issues taken care of but <laughs> it looks like she sees that easy button all right how do we want to handle this we'll keep moving Did she? Okay. Motion passes five zero. All right. Uh, with uh, that, I, this is Mary Elizabeth Geiger, hi, uh, City Attorney. I would say um, if you guys have a quorum, which it appears that you do, I, I know Councillor Lenhart wants to participate, um, but it might be unless you guys, as a council, feel strongly about having her participate. Just with this, clearly, there's some issues with her being able to hear you guys. Um, and you know the delay that maybe uh, she just listens in and obviously can be up on the screen. Hopefully, has a chat function if she needs to say something. But for um, for voting, routine voting purposes, um, you know, you could you could move forward without her participating. All right. Thank you, Mary Elizabeth. So for the motion to adopt the agenda. That has been seconded. The motion made by Councillor Harvey, mo uh, seconded by Councillor Bremen. Uh, motion passes 4 0. 4 0. And I would just reflect in the record that Commissioner Lenhart is, I, I think you already did this anyway, appearing um, you know, virtually, but is having technical difficulties and was unable to vote. Got it. All right. 
With that, we're gonna move into public participation. Uh, so this section is set aside for the city council to listen to comments by the public regarding items that do not otherwise appear on this agenda. Generally, the city council will not discuss the issue and will, take, will not take official action under this section. Uh, we please ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on something not on the agenda? If you'd please step up to the podium and state your name and address for the record, please. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and not break anything. Sorry, sorry. No. Uh, Matt Barber, 334 Crystal Court here in Fruta. Uh, as always, thank you for uh, your service to each and every one of you. It is greatly appreciated and uh, just, just very thankful to see you all lead by example in your service. Uh, I just wanted to pray for all of you, wanted to pray for our town and just wanted to pray for this meeting. So Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity for us to uh, experience the government that you have set forth in our great country. Uh, we just don't want to take anything for granted. We are just humbled that you have allowed us to live where we live and to live in the times that we do live. And Father, I want to thank you for the men and women on this council. Thank you for their leadership. Thank you for their desire to uh, just serve the community, for their desire just to, uh, and their willingness to give up of their own time, their own efforts, uh, their own uh, thoughts, and just uh, other priorities that they might have in their life. Thank you for uh, just their commitment to this time. Father, I just ask that you would bless them, that you would give them great wisdom, that you would give them great insight into all matters that uh, this city has to deal with, that they would be able to act in a way that is honoring to you, that is honoring to the people. And Father, we would continue to uh, just bless our community so that we may be just a, a, a great example to the rest of this county, to the rest of this state, that other people would see uh, just how blessed we are. Um, just uh, in large part, the efforts of these men and women. So we love you. Thank you so much for tonight. Pray this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on something not on the agenda? All right, if you please state your name and address for the record. My name is Janet Wyatt. I live at 235 Drumlin Circle here in Fruta. And good evening. I come tonight to voice my concerns, as well as from so many others, regarding the Highway 650 Fremont two-way street project to Otley Road. I previously heard a few years ago of our peaceful walking lane getting turned into an entire street that dismissed it as a rumor. After attending coffee with the city manager this summer, I learned this to be true. After that, I talked to every person I would encounter this summer, walking dogs, riding bikes, running, jogging, and strolling, asking them if they knew of the project. No, they didn't, and they were disturbed at this news. We hate to lose this haven of peace and quiet. Our quality of life will not be enhanced by a steady flow of traffic, but diminished by noise and exhaust from the hundreds of vehicles that will be buzzing up and down. I suffer from asthma, and I'm genuinely concerned by poor air quality. I don't want to have to move. I do love Fruta. I went to the farmer's market to voice my concerns, but wonder if any of the negative feedback was even recorded. My neighbor was smart enough to write a letter. She told the city engineer that she thought she was living in her forever home on a fairly quiet street. Her husband is disabled, and she was concerned that emergency vehicles wouldn't be able to get to him with so many cars on the move. The city engineer told her that maybe she should sell their home. I was appalled. Two homes were sold, one of them, one of hers this summer. The other sold out of concerns of raising their baby on what would become a major artery. This project may have been planned 20 years ago, but the times have changed and we have climate change and species and habitat loss to consider. I find it criminal to cut down 100 year old cottonwood trees that provide beautiful shade and cover for many birds. And there's all the extra heat that's gonna come from cutting the trees and shrubs and radi radiating off of the additional pavement. These trees should be preserved as we do historic buildings. If Fruta is the bike friendly town it purports to be, we should be encouraging more students to ride to school. It's time to stop doing things as they've always been done. Think about a healthy future for our children and grandchildren. Because I know this project has already started, I say let's funnel the traffic onto J and two tenths up to Pine and not through our neighborhood. I ask the council to use more scrutiny when approving developments. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Janet. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak on something not on the agenda? 
All right, hearing none, we're gonna close the par public participation and uh, move into our consent agenda. So these are items where all conditions or requirements have been agreed to or met prior to the time they come before the council for final action. These items will be approved by a single motion of the council. Uh, so we're gonna open this up to public comment. Is there anybody that'd like to speak on something on the consent agenda? All right, hearing none, we'll bring it back to council. Are there any questions or do we have a motion? I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Councillor Lenhart? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Harvey? Yes. Councillor Cry? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. <clears throat> All right. Uh, with that, we're going to move into our public hearings. And so we've got several public hearings tonight. Our first one is a quasi-judicial uh, public hearing. Uh, and so with those, just so the audience knows, um, we're gonna hear from uh, city staff. And then from there, we're gonna hear from the applicant and then we'll open it up to public comment. Uh, and then once we close public comment, we'll come back to council. Uh, so our first item is Cider Mills Estates uh, preliminary plan. And Henry's gonna present on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council, and uh, the public in attendance tonight. My name is Henry. I'll be giving uh, the staff presentation on the Cider Mill Estates preliminary plan. This is application number 2021-37. And uh, with that, I'll get started. Uh, project description. Uh, the subject property is uh, approximately 13.25 acres. Uh, proposed is 47 single family lots ranging in size from 7,000 square feet to just over uh, 10,000 square feet for a total of around 3.5 dwelling units per acre. Uh, you can see in your packet and on this slide, uh, there's a centrally located park. It's about 1.29 acres uh, with residents uh, around it. The property is zoned South Fruita residential and uh, primary access will be taking uh, place through three platted uh, street stubs one from Apple Lane to the east through Garden Estate subdivision. Uh, to the north is Stone Mountain Drive and to the west is uh, South Maple Street um, or 17 and a half road. Here's a, a zoning map of the subject property. You can see there in the kind of the tannish color, that's the South Fruita residential zone. To the north and to the east, uh, there's community residential. And then there's a planning and development zone uh, just to the west. Um, all other properties uh, that you see there in, in color are in the city limits. This is large lot residential uh, here, which was part of the original subdivision that split off this 13 and uh, a quarter acre parcel. And anything in the white is county zoning, which is agricultural, forestry and transition, which is a county zoning designation. Uh, but more or less planned to be in the city at some point in the future. Moving right along into the approval criteria that must be considered for preliminary plans. This is set forth in chapter 15 of our land use code. Uh, there are seven criteria that must be considered. Um, adequate resolution of all review comments and compliance with conditions of approval of any sketch plan. There's no sketch plan that was submitted, uh, but there were uh, review comments that were given uh, to staff through the review period, and then we're in your packets as well for tonight's review. Uh, conformance with the City of Fruita's Master Plan, Land Use Code, Design Criteria, and Construction Specifications Manual, and other city policies and regulations. So through the review, uh, city staff, our city engineer, planning, um, and public works all have an opportunity to kind of review this project and make sure that um, it's in conformance with our code. Uh, if not, review comments are generated and response to comments are usually expected after that uh, is digested by the applicant and the applicant's representative. Um, this application can meet uh, all of the, or can be in conformance with all of those uh, items that I listed above uh, based on the review and adequate response to comments, which usually happen at the final plat application after, to, after tonight, sorry. Uh, compatibility with the area around the subject property in accordance with uh, section 17.07.080. Uh, this is uh, just a residential subdivision, three and a half dwelling units per acre through the zone change from large lot residential to South Fruita residential, which occurred earlier this year. The review of kind of the density compatibility occurred 
And what was proposed with this application is continuing to be in conformance with the density and the land uses proposed are in alignment with those around the, the subdivision. So single family residential uh, dwelling units on uh, lot sizes that do meet our land use code for that zone district. Uh, adequate provision of all required services and facilities. This is including, but not limited to uh, roads, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, parks, police protection, fire protection, domestic water, wastewater, irrigation, water and storm drainage facilities. Uh, obviously through the review comments, if they have not been met or need to be addressed, obviously uh, response to comments will need to occur. But most of the services and facilities are in place or can be in place. Uh, the applicant or the, the application is proposing kind of a joint use of the irrigation structure that was constructed with Garden Estates, which is a subdivision just to the east of this, and then utilizing the same for the drainage system, the stormwater uh, drainage component of this subdivision, same thing applies. Uh, through the project narrative, there, there should be an agreement in place between the two subdivisions uh, for maintenance and costs and, and uh, all that stuff that occurs with facilities like that. And I'm sure the applicant's representative uh, can touch on that as well tonight. Um, but obviously response to comments must happen. Uh, the application was submitted with a traffic study. That traffic study indicated uh, the need for a turn lane on the front edge uh, for the density allotted. This kind of was the kicker with the Garden Estate subdivision. Uh, they brought the density down just a bit. And then any subdivision after that, it was more than aware that the, the traffic study indicated the need for a turn lane if more density were to occur on that south side of the interstate between kind of Cayley Street and uh, South Maple. And so that that is uh, occurring and then comments from CDOT are in your packet and also reemphasize the need for that turn lane to be constructed with this subdivision. Uh, preservation of natural features and adequate environmental protection. Uh, there's nothing really on the site that's been identified as kind of a, a, an occurring natural feature that should be preserved. However, uh, stormwater uh, management issues should be addressed and sedimentation, weed and dust controls will be required as part of the construction process. So dust mitigation, having a water truck out there to make sure when the wind kicks up, it's not you know causing an issue or a nuisance to existing property owners nearby. Uh, and number number seven, uh, ability to resolve all comments and recommendations from reviewers uh, without a significant redesign. Staff feels that uh, there should be no significant redesign. And what that would mean is if density were to increase, open space were to decrease from what's proposed or uh, a modification of our construction specifications uh, or minimum requirements for you know, wastewater, sanitary sewer, stuff like that. Uh, any deviation from that would kick in a significant redesign and come back through the public hearing process. Staff does not feel that there's a need for that to address the review comments. Uh, the integrity of this project or what's been proposed should remain uh, similar to what has been constructed if this were to move on to construction and the final planning. So uh, that, that can be met uh, with the final plat. That's when we will essentially review response to comments from this application. Um, so that's it for the uh, land use code requirements, the review with the project. Uh, to touch on legal notice, uh, always feel that it's important to touch base on this in the public hearing uh, is uh, we're required to uh, conduct legal notice for properties around there, uh, send out legal notice uh, postcards that go out all, to all the property owners within 350 foot radius. And you can see that here in this uh, highlighted buffer area. Uh, we essentially highlight this subject property and buffer around at 350 feet and then take out all of those addresses and send out postcards telling what the project is, when to attend these meetings and how to uh, you know, attend and, and provide comment if they needed to. So that occurred on October 22nd. Uh, and um, I preface that it, it needs to occur 15 days prior to the planning commission meeting. And uh, that did occur within that 15 day uh, timeframe. A legal notice was placed in the paper um, on October 23rd. That was kind of just a, a legal notice in the newspaper, you know, basically saying that we're gonna have a, a, a conversation as a public hearing about this project and then how to attend and on the same language from the postcards is put there. Um, and then on the property as well, that happened on October 21st. Uh, because there's multiple, you know, 
basis for you know uh, people to kind of see what's going on with the subject property. We felt like uh, it was uh, a good deal and transparent to put um, these postcards where you see these uh, stars. So we put one at all the street stubs essentially to inform the public. There's a public notice of application review and you can see here in the pictures that were taken when that happened and that happened well within the 15 days prior to the planning commission. Uh, public comments, review comments and planning commission meeting. Uh, no written public comments were received uh, by staff uh, up, up to this point. Comments were received at the planning commission meeting with concerns about drainage. A property owner uh, nearby was kind of concerned that is the you know, future runoff from storms going to affect their property. Um, and there's tailwater that goes into that storm drain or that um, Garden Estate subdivision for stormwater that should help handle uh, any of those concerns and drainage should go to the street and then out to where it needs to go. Um, review comments, all review comments received have been included in the uh, staff report materials in your packet and the planning commission recommended approval by a vote of four to zero at their November 9th public hearing. And then the staff recommendation and the options available, those are included in the cover sheet, probably on page two of the cover sheet. Uh, and they are in the staff report as well. Uh, but there's three options available, approve as proposed, approve with conditions uh, or deny uh, the Cider Mill Estates preliminary plan. And then the staff recommendation there, I'm not gonna read word for word, but you guys have it in your, your cover sheet. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, that concludes my presentation and we'll turn the time back over. All right, thank you. And we have the applicant's representative here. Do you wanna add some comment to this? Please state your name and address for the record, please. Sure. Hi, good evening, City Council, the staff. My name is Kim Kirk. I own Kirk Land Consulting in Grand Junction. Um, I'm the project manager and representative for Cider Mills uh, Estates proposed subdivision. Um, Henry did a great job, as always, gave you all the information. Um, and I just want to summarize, really, and follow up on with what he had to say. Um, you know, as he said, uh, it's a we're south through to residential 47 proposed units, which equates to um, 3.5 dwelling units acre per acre. So that's, you know, not maximizing. It's, it, it's a nice, you know, equal balance on this project. Um, but to summarize on uh, Henry's, Henry's presentation, we can meet all the comments. Um, either we have or we will. Um, we'll work diligently with the planning department and engineering and make sure that we do meet all of those criteria and requirements. Um, we recently submitted some comments or response comments, but it was very short notice, of course, to staff. It was Friday and uh, we received a lot of information. And then I sent it in on Saturday, bounced back. I had too much information. And so they did not get my uh, comments until Monday, but um, you know, we can satisfy all of those comments. Um, just to call out a few of them, like the C of CDOT access permits that are required. We have actually, um, uh, committed those uh, access permits already, paid the fees, and, and those are in process with CDOT. Um, we can meet all the stormwater requirements. We're in the process of um, acquiring all the stormwater permits state and countywide. Um, we are uh, working on the shared utilities, as Henry mentioned, between garden estates and um, <laughs> I call it the wrong name, honestly, <laughs> Cider Mills and Garden Estates. Um, we're in the process of an agreement, and then I've done this in the past with other subdivisions that had a shared detention pond and, uh, and or shared irrigation facilities. So we've, we've submitted a rough draft at this point to the city to review, um, but it is in process with our attorney. We are working through those details and combining those details with the CCNRs as well as the agreement between the two subdivisions so that, you know, the costs are managed, the shared facilities are managed. There's a, you know, there's a plan in place, um, you know, who's gonna pay for what and, and how is this all gonna work out? So um, I, like I said, I do have a rough draft that I've submitted, but uh, it's definitely not final. Um, 
And again, the, you know, the comments we can or will meet all of those. We'll work through everything with all the utilities, wet and dry, with the planning and engineering, and, and make sure that we do meet all of those uh, requirements. And as Henry mentioned, um, probably the thing that would throw this all backwards or be um, a difficulty on this project would be a lot of modifications. And I don't see that happening. We, you know, we're, we're committed to where we're at maybe some you know little minor adjustments um, but we have uh, incorporated the park design we have a landscaping design um, you know we're we're really paying attention to the details and working through all the details and i just wanted to to reaffirm that for you and let you know that we are working diligently to to get those things albeit slowly and you know, everybody's busy and short staffed and behind but uh, we are working diligently on those happy to answer any questions if you have any we're going to open up to public comment and we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kim. All right, with that, uh, we're going to open this up for public comment. So if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item, uh, now would be the opportunity to do that. So is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? All right, hearing none, I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to council. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this item? All right, do we have a motion? I'll move that we approve the proposed Cider Mill Estate preliminary plan with the condition that all review comments and issues identified be adequately resolved with the final plat application. Second. Councilor Lenhart. <laughs> ah, sorry, yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Cry? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to move into our legislative hearings. Uh, so our first item on that is our adoption of our 2022 annual budget. Uh, we've got our city clerk, finance director, Margaret Sell here to uh, present on this item. And are we going to approve all these in one motion? Or are we doing separate motions on each one of these? Uh, separate motions on each okay. one of these. I'm sorry. All right. That's all right. <laughs> So this is a continuation of the public hearing that we had at the last council meeting, uh, pending final uh, adoption tonight and certification of mill levies. The first item that we have before you is the annual fees and terms for the 2022 budget year. There are several proposed uh, fee adjustments uh, for next year. Those for utility charges include a, is that better? $2 a month increase in the sewer, uh, residential sewer charges, and essentially a 4% increase in all of the related sewer charges for commercial property uh, consumption and volume-based charges. Um, we also have an increase in trash service, which is a pass-through from our trash provider waste management. And that's an increase of 55 cents to $15.30 a month. And then related increases as well for carts and senior citizens. Um, and then establishing a new, a new trash charge for extra carts at $6.70 per month for those that um, are using the cart-based system. Then we also have an increase of $10 a year for our annual irrigation, and that's just for the irrigation that's part of the city-operated and maintained irrigation system. There are a number of homeowner-maintained irrigation systems that this would not apply to, uh, but the $10 increase would just apply to the city of Fruita operated and maintained system. And then we also are proposing an increase uh, from $500 to $750 uh, for irrigation taps. That fee of $500 has never been changed uh, in the 40 years that I've been here. <laughs> so uh, it's while it's a substantial increase, it's uh, probably long overdue. And there are really very few irrigation taps sold. It's based on that core area of town. Um, so it's really just certain properties that are applicable to that irrigation system. Uh, then we also have uh, some changes in the eligibility criteria for our senior citizen rate. And that's based on the federal poverty level and is adjusted every year based on that federal poverty level. So those amounts go up um, for both single persons and uh, couples to the amounts that you see listed. Other fee increases include um, an increase of 6% in the drainage impact fee that is based on calculations within the code uh, guiding that impact fee. 
We have a school land dedication fee that is increased from 730 to 920. And then the use tax on building materials, while it does not increase, it remains at 3%, is, it's based on some increased values in, um, uh, that are in, published by the International Code Council for different types of construction. Uh, and then we're also proposing a fee in the business license. This fee would not go into effect until January 1 of 2023. However, we send out renewal notices in November of the prior year for those business licenses. So we figure establish it now, that way there's plenty of time uh, for education as well as printing of materials and so forth. Um, and that would increase from $25 to $30 per year. Once again, that's another fee that has never been increased since I've been here. Um, and I use that just because I've been here so long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if there's any questions on any of those fee adjustments, I'll try and answer those. If not, just uh, we'll need a, a motion to approve. I don't know, Mayor, if you would like to wait and hold all the motions to the end and after the public hearing, or if you want to do them individually one at a time. Because mm. I was going to open a public hearing. So we can do one public hearing at the end of all of your- Yes, and then you could do individual motions after that. <laughs> okay. So I'll move on to, um, if there's no questions on the fees and charges, the next item. And it is the adoption of the 2022 budget. And you can see that the uh, annual budget that we have proposed for next year has $38 million overall impact. That includes current year revenues of 25.3 million, uh, transfers from other funds, which are kind of a double counting of revenue of $8 million and then use of fund balance or the savings account of $4.7 million for that overall $38 million expense and budget. Um, we've spent the last number of months going over individual components of the budget um, and trying to answer any questions and uh, inform you of what's, what's contained within the budget document. Uh, but if there are any additional questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Questions, all right. Pardon? questions. No questions. Okay. <laughs> the next item we have is a resolution that appropriates money for the 2022 budget. So once the budget is adopted, you have to legally appropriate the funds in order to actually spend the funds. And that's statutory requirements. Um, and so that resolution um, just kind of approaches the budget in a little bit different manner, but appropriates it for expenditures um, and is broken down by operating expenses and capital uh, project expenses and transfers and equipment. It, once again, if there's any questions, please stop me and I'll <laughs> try and answer those as best as I can. So that's the annual appropriation resolution. The last item we have is the mill levy certification resolution. The mill levy proposed for next year is not changed from the current year. We did receive the final assessed values from the Mesa County Assessor's Office um, on Friday, or, or I guess last Wednesday, actually. Uh, so those numbers reflect the current assessments uh, of property values within the city of Fruta. And that mill levy is established at 10.146 mills. Uh, and that is all I have under the budget adoption section. All right, well, thank you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open this up to public comment. Uh, so if anybody has any questions on any of these items, uh, now would be the time to do that. So is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on one of these budget items? All right, hearing none, I'll come back to council. Does anybody have any questions regarding budget? Mr. Mayor, I move we approve resolution 2021-39 establishing the fees and charges for the 2022 budget year. Second. Councilor Lenhart. Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Cray? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. Our second one is resolution 2021 40. Are you opening to public comment? We open up all of them to public comment. Okay. okay. So we're on right. a motion. Got it. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I uh, propose we 
adopt resolution 2021-40, a request to approve a resolution adopting the 2022 annual budget. Second. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Mr. Bremen? Yes. Councilor Cray? Yes. Motion passes by zero. And then I'll move, we adopt resolution 2021-41, resolution appropriating funds for the 2022 annual budgets. Second. Councillor Lenhart? Yes. Mr. Cray? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Well, I have a question. Did you, did you say it right? Because you said the annual budget and it says fiscal year on the... Maybe I'm nitpicking. No, you're talking about the, the actual motion is different than what's printed in the agenda. Okay. Yes. Uh, Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Harvey? Yes. Motion passes by. Forty-two. Yes. I'll do another one. Uh, I move that we approve resolution 2021-42 establishing the property tax mill levy for the 2022 budget. Second. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Cry? Yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Passes by zero. All right, so that is all of our budget adoption. Uh, we've got one more legislative hearing. It's resolution 2021-38, a request to approve a resolution amending the 2021 budget with supplemental appropriations. Okay, this should be the final budget amendment for the 2021 budget year and cleans up um, a variety of different areas in the budget. Um, in the general fund, we had some fence damages at the police department uh, due to a driver driving into it. Um, so the supplemental appropriation covers the cost of those repairs and we are recouping those funds from the driver's insurance company. So the revenues are available to do that. In the marketing and promotion fund, we had uh, about $2,300 uh, of repair expenses for the billboard in excess of the amounts budgeted. Revenues from lodging taxes are higher than we budgeted. And so those revenues are available to offset those expenses. In the public places fund, um, we received a contribution of $1,850 to assist with uh, higher than budgeted expenses for the North Desert, uh, North Frida Desert Wildlife Survey. So those contribution funds are available to offset the expense of that increased cost of the survey. And then in the trash fund, um, we are just tidying up the actual revenues and expenses based on increased usage and adjustments to estimates that were included in the budget. Uh, revenues are available for monthly charges to pay the offset uh, increased expense in picking up the trash service, and that's $23,000. Uh, so funds are available for all the additional expenses, um, and this kind of just tidies this up and keeps us within budget numbers for the remainder of the year. All right, thanks, Margaret. Uh, with this one, uh, again, because it's a legislative hearing, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on this item? All right, hearing none, I'll bring it back to council. Are there any questions on this one? Uh, yes, uh, small one. Um, do we know the cost of the community cleanup day? We, we have some labor costs. I'm not sure what those are, but it's I probably 16 to 20 hours of time involved from the public works department. And then if I recall, Shannon, you're shaking your head, you know. I can't remember if it was $200 or $600 for the clean off, the roll offs from the trash. Rather minimal. Yeah, it's a very, very minimal cost. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, no further questions from either. All right, any other questions? I think the, the only other thing is just to say thank you to Margaret and staff for all the work that you guys put in and, you know, months worth of work and then a couple months of presentations thanks to the department directors and everybody on staff for making that happen. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I move we adopt resolution 2021-38 amending the 2021 budget to appropriate additional funds in the various funds from the sources noted for unanticipated expenses. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Cry? 
Yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. We do not have anything on our administrative agenda, so we're going to move into our. All right, thank you, Mayor and members of Council for the opportunity to give a quick update. Uh, first, uh, although it's been said, I, I echo the, the gratitude and the work for the 2022 annual budget. It, it always seems a bit anticlimactic at the final hearing uh, because of, but uh, because it's so, there's been so much work that's been going on for a number of months. So I appreciate Margaret Sell and Shannon Boston and their their uh, significant amount of work, the department directors, your leadership. I'm really proud of the annual budget that's been adopted because uh, it's it's highly focused on results of the community survey that we have that we received in 2021, and the results of a uh, significant amount of community engagement that went into our comprehensive plan and, and master plan updates. Uh, so uh, really uh, appreciate all the efforts that went into that and for those who may see this record or, or be participating tonight you know it, it definitely started in the public process with drafts um, publicly available since september with every council meeting with many presentations in detail in every area of the budget so uh it's 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 a huge effort and i uh, appreciate all the work that's been done on that also a reminder that this this weekend, this Saturday evening, I believe at 5.30 is the, the Parade of Lights that the Fruta Area Chamber of Commerce uh, hosts and, and, and we participate in support. And so we're excited for that. The um, Also, uh, Wanda, the last item I had for tonight was I wanted to formally introduce, you all know our new Parks and Recreation Director, but uh, we haven't done this in a council meeting yet uh, and uh, appreciated the participation from Many public partners and agencies, and, and and those of you in the in the meet and greet when we had finalists at the community center, and uh, excited that Mark Mancuso is our new Parks and Recreation Director. He's a he's a month in uh, to the job, and and uh, doing a great job. He he came from City of Grand Junction. We had applicants from all over, uh, actually many different states, and uh, and Mark's experience and fit and demeanor uh, were just a, a great combination for. Uh, the long-term goals that we have in that department and the experience that he's had in overseeing uh, Stoker Stadium and, and uh, um, Canyon View Park and other, other significant projects in Grand Junction aid uh, bode very well for some of the things we have in line moving forward. He spent a lot of time meeting with all the employees in the park, all the, uh, especially the full-time and, and, and permanent part-time uh, Parks and Recreation employees, getting to know them and taking a lot of time to, to meet with, starting to meet with more and more of our public partners. So I wanted to give Mark an opportunity to step up to the podium and just uh, say a couple of things about himself. If you have any questions, feel, feel free to ask and put them on the spot, but I'd like to uh, formally welcome and, and uh, congratulate Mark on being the Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Fruta. Welcome, Mark. I guess the mic's all yours. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. You know, uh, it was great going through that process. Uh, very nerve wracking, uh, for sure, but uh, happy to be part of um, Fruta now. Um, you know, I think the, the Fruta logo, um, I need to get some shirts with that now. But uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome to be out here. The culture and everything that you guys have been doing is awesome. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited. So I can't wait to work with all of you guys and with members of the community and uh, all of our partners. So, yeah. You're welcome. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. We have to be nervous next time we see run into Greg. What's that? We have to be nervous next time we run into Greg. <laughs> Come at me, Greg. <laughs> Here, you're out there, Greg. <laughs> we definitely need to give him some swag. We don't want him wearing any of that junction stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I. I Took no, I don't refer to it as uh, Grand Junction anymore. So, uh, Fruita East. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Mark. All right, Mike, is that the last on your? That's it. Thanks. All right. All right, with that, we're going to move into our council reports and actions. Our first item is the cancellation of upcoming city council workshop meeting. Um, so, we've all got that in our um, packets. So I don't know if there's any questions that was, we're canceling the Tuesday, December 28th uh, workshop. Um, and 
we don't have an alternate unless we need one. There is, there's not anything on the agenda, correct, Mike, that we need to, that we can't schedule until January? That is correct. All we need is a motion to cancel the... I'd move that we approve the cancellation of Tuesday, December 28th, 2021 workshop meeting of this, the Fruita City Council. Second. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Council Lenhart. Yes. I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Didn't hear. All right. Uh, our next item is council reports and actions. So I'm going to start down with Matthew. Uh, really not a lot to report, just uh, I don't know if everybody's aware, on GJEP, uh, the gentleman that they offered the job to uh, has since declined uh, to take that position at GJEP, so Steve is still currently the interim director. Okay, that's it. Heather? Planning Commission is this next Tuesday, and I missed our first Parks and Rec meeting with Mark because um, I had other obligations with the school district. Uh, no meetings as of late, and the December meetings I have are both canceled, so nothing from me. All right, Kyle? Nothing to report right now. All right, I got a, a couple things. So uh, with that, I've got, I got a call today, and I want to run this past council and just uh, probably staff uh, about Cavalcade, and they were talking about, I know Ken's involved in that a lot about how to fundraise for that, or if there are any type of grants or funding that the city can help. They said, this, we won't say that. Fruita East, like I just heard tonight, was uh, does some of that for nonprofits. And I said, right now, I don't know of any funding options that we've got to help with capital. But they've got, uh, got the new hotel tax that is for the business stuff. So I just said I'd br bring it out here because I'm not sure, because I know uh, they said sometimes they have trouble with just paying rent and all that, especially with the last year, not being able to have the tax that they've got there. So I don't know if you've got something, Mike, or? I was just going to say, we can definitely take a look. There's a number of new funding mechanisms out there and, and definitely some in the arts category that we can we can research and bring back some information, both to Cavalcade and to Council. Okay, and the other one I was going to ask Kyle is because I think the Arts and Culture Board also is looking at what their fund, what, yeah. what they should do with their funding. So thought that might be there, a good fit as in, well. At our next meeting, the Fruita City or the, the Arts and Culture Board will be presenting to the council. And one of the things that they're talking about is a grant program. Um, so how that will be decided is still, they're still hashing out the details, but um, that's definitely a possibility of something that they could apply for. I think they're going to be smaller grants, but um, might help out a little bit. And I, and I think that was their concern is just if they're going on 10 years and they wouldn't want to see something like that disappear. And so, um, so, Mr. Mayor, are they looking for grants for operational expenses or program expenses? That's what they're still trying to figure out because I said we wouldn't really probably be able to do anything unless we know specifically what the funds are for. Gotcha. But I know in the past they said they got to the unknown. Rent and heat is probably my guess. Okay. That's about that. Well, and water. Okay, so I just want to bring it to at least aware so everybody's aware, you know, if they hear of anything out in public on what that looks like. Um, the other thing I've got is Monument Ridge Elementary School. Did we want to try and reschedule that for the next meeting? Because I know normally we do the first meeting of the month, but I didn't know if you wanted to, if, if that was kind of what. Yeah, we, if we were going to offer to them, if, if they'd like to do it at the next meeting in December, or we could do, we, we do have one scheduled in January in the first meeting, but we could, uh, or I might have that backwards. We have, we could offer them one of the open January meetings as well, where we don't have a school coming and see what works best for them. We, we do in January, it's the, which meeting is that? Do we do it on? I guess it'd be the, the first meeting in January. We have a school, so we could offer it the third Tuesday of January to them as well. All right, I just wanna make sure we don't, we get that rescheduled. Um, 
All right, and then the, uh, I don't have any other meetings. They're all coming up. We don't have uh, tourism this month. And then I've got chamber board meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, so uh, with that, then I wanted to also uh, bring up the email that I sent out to everybody. I know in a workshop about three months ago, uh, we talked about prayer uh, invitation for our meetings. And so hey, Joel, can you speak closer to the mic? I can't hear I can. you. All right, I can. Can you hear me now? And don't don't forget me. I won't, I won't forget you. Um, so, oh yeah, council reports. Let's go to you, Karen, then we'll come back to mine. How's that? Oh, I, see, I did, okay. I would have forgot you, so. Uh, okay, um, I really don't have a lot, but the museum, we did have a meeting. They've got some good prospects for uh, board members that they're doing interviews for, and they're actually in a pretty good uh, financial state which is um, different from years uh, in the past. So I think that's, that's positive. I did have a, a comment, like, and I don't know if this is possible, but the, those pedestrian crossings on uh, like eight, I think it's 18 Road and Paber um, or somewhere close to that and Otley and the trail, you know, where we just, we've got a sign, but, um, I've just been, you know, whether it's uh, before school, I mean, the traffic that's going fast and we've got, you know, we've had some close calls, I think on those. Oh, can't hear you. We lost your audio, Karen. She went. Oh, she sorry. Muted. Um, so anyway, I'm wondering about, I've seen them in Utah, the, the flags that, go from, you know, when you, you're going to cross, you pick up a flag off the pole and you walk it across and then put it on the other side. So it get, has a little bit of a, a flash to drivers. I don't know if that's something that um, would be a possibility, but um, those were just two things that I've noticed over the last few weeks. Or maybe the flashing lights, like on 12th Street by CMU. We did add flashing lights to that. Oh, you did? They do push right before you go across. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess I haven't. Okay. Not at, oh, where are the flashing lights? At, on Otley, at a crossing, uh, crossing Otley at 18 and a half. She's talking paper in 18 road. Oh, paper in 18 no. road. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, both oh, of them. Sorry, I've I, never seen, yeah. Are, are you, sorry, I'm, are we talking the, the Pine Street? No. The tra the little saltwash trail? Is that what yes, you're yes, Yeah. Yeah. Where that, that crosses. One? Oh, I see. Okay. Probably, yeah. Okay. So much yeah. Yeah. dangerous there. Yeah. 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 Okay. We, yeah, just, we can look into that. Just a thought. I mean, I didn't think it'd be a huge expense, but it might be helpful with um, get, you know, getting driver's attention. That's it. All right. Well, thank you, Karen. All right. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll speak into the mic so you can hear me. All right. Um, so I sent out an email. I know we had a meeting probably six months ago about invocation before our meeting and council had decided not to do that. Uh, before I start into that conversation, I just wanted to thank this council for all they do. Um, it's given me time to research and do other things. And um, I've got a strong faith already, but it's given me the opportunity to really add more prayer into my life and, and looking into what we should do on this topic itself. And so I've done a lot of research. Um, I sent out some to you guys. I wanted to open up that conversation again. Um, Mike has talked to Mary Elizabeth about some of this. So I wanna share all that information as well as get some more feedback uh, on, on this topic. I firmly believe that we should have invocation before uh, our meetings, or at least before one, um, and a moment of silence before the other one. I want to give you guys some history on. Pardon me, Mr. Mayor. Should yeah. we wait till we have full council here for this? Discussion? We've got we've got a majority here, so I mean, that's um, I'm I'm not. I guess I'm not willing to wait. So I'd rather get discussion and input uh, on it tonight. Um, so, and I did talk to Lori because she messaged that she wasn't going to be here tonight. And so just to get a little bit of history about um, the process. So it was 10 years ago when Ken Henry was our mayor. 
they did prayer before every meeting and he'd invite uh, local citizens to come in and pray uh, before the meeting. And at that time, he was having a challenge finding people to come in. And so it was about 10 years ago that they changed it to one meeting of moment of silence and, and one uh, with the invocation before the meeting started. And so that was where that kind of changeover happened uh, with that. Um, looking at historically, um, if you look at since 1774, uh, the, the country for every one of their meetings has had an invocation before every meeting. Uh, that they have. Uh, that was in the, as they were preparing to uh, create the Declaration of Independence, it started. So two years before um, the actual declaration was written. And then every year since then, or every meeting since then, they do that. And so um, I, I come from a, two different perspectives. One is from a precedence of it's been done uh, for decades uh, with that. And one from, uh, listening to our community and you know uh what actually what the founding father said prayer was made for it was made for a solemn start to a meeting so that way people have time to to think about what's going to be said and that um there is a higher power you know no matter what religion you are when they looked at what religion started uh in our country you know we had puritans quakers we had uh, jewish communities there was there's many different communities that uh, served on setting up that Declaration of Independence. And so it's not about one specific religion, one specific prayer. It's about just that mindset that there are bigger things out there than what we as a council. And then, you know, having a community like we've got, um, I think it's uh, something very important to have available in our community. So that's where I'm coming from. And so I'm going to open it up to anybody on council that wants to talk about this item i'll go first all right uh yeah i i have personal feelings but uh as a procedural um i feel like council has talked about it like you said and and maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea when we see the new council and get some new members if they want to revisit that it might be a good time to for the new council to see if they have a difference different opinion than the last one. All right. Matthew's looking at me. No, I just, I have notes based on the notes that you sent. All right, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I want to squash others. No, good. So you, you mentioned um, you know, the founding fathers uh, and you know I looked at the cases uh, uh, that you put forth, uh, the, the Greece case, um, which was a five to four split by the Supreme Court. Correct. So I sat and read through the dissent, uh, uh, dissent opinions on this to kind of get their perspective. First of all, the fact uh, what you bring up uh, about uh, in terms of the founding fathers, uh, in terms of prayer, there was distinction made on that. However, um, that uh, the town, those meetings weren't open for town participations those prayers were only for those members, the legislatures that were actually there. So they made that distinction. So why this becomes important, um, and I'm gonna steal um, some of uh, Justice Kagan's, uh, where he said, I respectfully dissent from the court's opinion because I think the town of Greece's prayer practices violate the norm of religious equality. The breathtakingly generous uh, constitutional idea that our public institutions belong to no less to the Buddhist or Hindu than to a Methodist or an Episcopalian. So I do think there is a challenge with that presenting prayers at the beginning ultimately exclude some group, no matter how hard you try. And then we have citizens of all faith that come before council um, on matters that impact many facets of their lives. So in the act that we ask people to stand or bow heads uh, during a prayer can make people feel uncomfortable because of that. And then we're putting pressure on those people uh, or being coerced uh, into following along for fear of retribution. So I'm going to stand by. I am not comfortable with, I'm fine with a moment of silence. I'm not as comfortable with prayer before for those reasons. 
Does Karen want to go or do we want? I'm a little nervous that the attorney's name is up there. So. <laughs> Don't be nervous at all. I'm just here in case anybody wants any help. I'm happy, you know, to give some some thoughts on this issue. But you know, I, I I'm here if you would like for me to speak. But you know, you guys go ahead and and talk about this, and then let me know to hear from me. You know, I think I've been reading a really really interesting book called um, Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from a Culture of Contempt by Arthur C. Brooks. And it's, it's fascinating because his, his premise is that right now we're just stewing in contempt and that is driven by media, network media, all sides and social media. And the, the media is of course trying to keep us fearful because that's how they make money because we keep watching and then we keep being fearful and, and that we're so polarized right now because um, we're just constantly thinking in terms of us versus them and they're the bad guys and we're the good guys and it's it's polarized. And so I, I bring that up because I've been thinking a lot in my own life about trying to be careful about not vilifying people who might be different than me or might not, not theming, not othering other people. And so this is a great opportunity to try to understand because we have different different points of view. And you know, so I reached out to you personally um, because I wanted to hear from you. What, I know this is important to you and I know this is important to some of our citizens. And I know it's also important to me and I know it's important to some of our other citizens. And so I, I wanted to try to, um, the premise of the book is when we get to know each other better one-on-one -on -one and we hear each other's hearts, it's harder to make you into a them because I, I know you and I respect you. And, and the key to bringing our country back together is being able to have honest dialogue and honest um, conversation. And that we don't always have to agree. And if we don't agree, one of us isn't automatically bad and one of us isn't automatically good, that, that we can all be good and have differences of opinions. And so I've been thinking a lot about that since, you know, reading your, your emails. Um, my... My comments are, are similar to Matthew's in that, well, first, I guess I need to say, I, and I'm just going to be really vulnerable. My spirituality is of utmost importance to me. I, I try every day to make sure I'm living an honest life and, and make sure I'm having integrity and make sure I'm having compassion and make sure I'm doing good works. And the fact that I don't belong to a religion doesn't mean that my spirituality is any less important to me. It's, it's critical. It's, it guides who I am. And when I'm, when I'm here and someone comes up to pray, it's not because I don't believe in prayer. It's not because I don't respect people of different religions. I just, I feel like prayer is an ultimately a very, very intimate thing. That, that, I, that I do in the privacy of my own home and the privacy of my own heart and the privacy of my own mind. And when someone comes up and prays here, I, I do feel uncomfortable because I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't wanna get up and walk out. That would be disrespectful to the person who's praying. And, and I, don't, I don't like, like the gentleman today who came was like, I don't, so I just stared at the sign because I don't know what to do. And that feels disrespectful, but to, to bow my head or fold my hands is disingenuous because that's, that's, not a, that's not a public, that's not a religious right, R-I-T-E, that, that I'm, I'm not a member of that community. It doesn't, it feels so odd to me. And so I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't want to be disrespectful, but I also don't want to participate. And and so I, I guess my fear is your God is great. Your God is great. Your God, uh, gods are all great. And, and you have an opportunity to, to pray anywhere for blessings to be upon this council that will make right decisions. You can do that somewhere else. I, I can only come here to do the work of the city. And, and it's just so awkward to be 
captive isn't the word I'm looking for. I don't know what word I'm looking for, but I, I can't do anything except for involuntarily participate in a religious rite that I'm not part of that religion. And, and so it, it, it feels like it becomes a way to do us versus them. We're going to pray and we're going to watch and see who prays. And if you don't pray, then you're them and you're not fit for public service and you're the enemy. That's how it feels in this polarized society that we live in. And I, and I totally understand that you feel probably the same way by us saying we don't want to pray. You're, you're feeling excluded and you're feeling like you're being marginalized. And, and so we're, we're, we're all feeling the same way. The difference is you, prayers can be, if your intent is to call down blessings upon this council, you can pray somewhere else and those blessings will still be bestowed. But I, I can't go anywhere else to do the work of the city. I have to come here. And, I, and it doesn't feel right, R-I-G-H-T, to have to participate in a religious right, R-I-T-E, that I'm not a, a member of. So that's, why, so that's why I brought it up in the first place. And it was never out of, I don't agree with prayer because I pray. And it was never a, out of, I want to disregard people's religious constitutional rights because I never said it wasn't unconstitutional. It clearly is. I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled in a couple of different cases. It, it was just, I, I, I want to come and do the work of the city and, and if I want to participate in a religious right, then I should go to a place where other people are all, we're all joining in that, not where it's, it's being f done to me. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Heather. A little bit, uh, <laughs> and then we'll go to <clears throat> Karen. Well, I don't know, the, like what's been expressed so far is from all of you has been nuanced and articulate and you know I when it really comes down to it um, my thoughts are that what what I want to honor the most is that there's a group of people that come together from different backgrounds and experiences and perspectives and we come together to work together even though we don't always agree and I, I want to honor that that we all make this great effort to do that and I think you know, that's like civilization at its finest at this point is the fact that there are people that are willing to get together that disagree and try and work through problems together um, by being vulnerable sometimes and by saying things that are maybe not super popular in the company that you're, you're keeping or, or, or whatever. But um, I don't like that something that we would do as part of our written agenda that's not mandated by the charter would make multiple people on the on the city council feel uncomfortable because i don't think that it's inherently the business of the city um you know i know the last time that this conversation happened one of the ideas that was um, expressed was that um, we could open up the rotary room or something like that for a prayer ahead of time for people that wanted to um, to gather before the, the meeting took place. And I think, I mean, I'd be all for that as, as something separate from the actual, um, from the agenda. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I don't think that we should be uh, making people feel excluded uh, because they don't have the same faith as somebody else on the council. And that's where I'm at with it. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Karen. Karen, did you? Well, you all are much more eloquent um, than, than I am, but I would have to say over the many years of going to council meetings, whether it be as a staff person or uh, just a mem you know, before I was on council uh, and since council, that we have a diverse community. And the times that I was feeling awkward and uncomfortable during those prayer moments. I know others were having the same feelings. 
for me, it's a personal thing. Uh, it, it's my spirituality is 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 mine, uh, and it's not. I, it's just not something that I would need to go out in public uh, with. I feel like uh, if there's a, I, I would support a moment of silence for personal reflection, but I agree with um, the words that have already been spoken that our jobs as representatives and city council people is to do the work of the city and um, and and that's and I don't think the prayer has a part in that. All right, thanks, Kerry. Yes. <laughs> With that, then I'm gonna I'm gonna add a few more comments in just because uh, listening to what everybody said with that. Um, and I know we work well as a diverse group. I know that's uh, one of the things and that we're here for uh, serving our community. One of the things I look at is the reverence of prayer uh, with many people in our community. It's not about a single religion. It's a, about a prayer to get us in the right mindset. And so that's where I disagree with the, we're here for get city work done. It's one of the things that prepares us for doing the job if our you know when we talk about the hundreds of years that it's been done it wasn't done to promote a specific religion it was done as a way to say hey let's prepare ourselves for that um and so that's where i'm coming from on that with that um i know uh mike talked with mary elizabeth a little bit earlier today so mary elizabeth i'm gonna uh call on you just for um a few questions if you're ready for that. Because um, one of the other, so what, looking at the Supreme Court cases regarding this, um, I guess part of my challenge with this is that we talk about being an inclusive city. And we wrote an inclusivity proclamation in November of 2018. And part of that was saying religion. And we're saying here as a council, oh, we can't have it in here, but we're an inclusive city. So that's a conflict. Nobody's saying you can have religion here. You can have your religion here. No, but I'm saying if this is, I'm not even talking about, I'm talking about a prayer that is a, not promoting a specific religion, but we're saying, hey, we're an inclusive city, but yet if we're, if we want to have a proclamation relating to race, if we want to have a proclamation relating to sexual orientation, if we want to have a proclamation for gender, it's okay. But if we want to have, a prayer at one meeting a month, then it's not okay. And that's where I have a challenge with this, you know, with the council saying, hey, we don't want to allow prayer. Um, we do make a, an interfaith proclamation every year um, that promote, you know, promotes and brings awareness to um, the different, the different group, you know, religious groups in the, in the valley, um, just to, to point that out. Right, we do that, I understand that. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Um, and, and this is why I wanna bring up the council because they're, um, I know Mary Elizabeth, I talked to Mike a little bit earlier about that today and I'm not gonna go this route, um, but if I understand it right, Mary Elizabeth, me as mayor leading the meeting, I could say a prayer at any time that I wanted to at the start of the meeting. I don't wanna do that without council's approval. You know, but that is one of the things, according to our charter, one good thing about this is I was able to read through the charter and learn a lot of things. And there's some, you know, areas where, you know, things are, as mayor, I have a few other rights, but I don't want to do anything against council. So because of that part of that respect, um, but that's why I'm asking council, is there compromise where you would allow prayer at one meeting and moment of silence at the next? Or is this council set against allowing that? I am far more comfortable with just a moment of silence. At every meeting? At every, or as the mayor sees fit. <clears throat> at every meeting, I mean, so if, I, I wanna make sure I understand where you're coming from. Um, 
that you view prayer um, as a way to get in this, the proper mindset to you know serve the community before each meeting is correct. correct. I think that can be done on an individual basis in a moment of silence where we each can have the opportunity if we so choose to do it in our own way. If, if that's the intent, that can be done in a moment of silence. My, my hesitation with one time a moment of silence and one time a prayer is that still someone's feeling, instead of being able to, someone's just feeling uncomfortable. Well, no matter what, somebody's gonna be all uncomfortable because if you guys could be comfortable because we don't do it, I can be uncomfortable saying, hey, I think this is the right thing to do. Because one of the things that after we've had this conversation, people can call it intuition and call it whatever. I call it God's leading in my life that he said, this is not right that we're cutting prayer out of our meeting. And so that's what's impressed on my heart. You know, so when we talk about uncomfortableness and all that, you know, when our feet get put to the fire, is when we grow and we learn. And that's one thing that I've taken from this is that it's giving me more in my life where I'm learning a little bit more about, you know, you know, I guess things I can't control. I can't control how you guys are going to vote. I can't control, you know, a lot of things in life. Um, I can have some influence on it. And so that's where I'm coming from on this side of it. Hey, Joel, I have a question for you. Um, so the moment of silence, that prayer you can't do silently. Uh, it's something that you have to to make public. Is that is that what you're saying? I do pray when I do, when it's the moment of silence. When we've had the moment of silence, I do. Um, I think there's just something about, and it's biblical that when you profess it out loud, that it has meaning. And so, I mean, that's a biblical principle that I believe in. Well, well I, I know, and I, I've been uh, kind of looking at this for a few years since I got on council is just, uh, you know, many got this at a CML conference, uh, groups that are cities that say the Athenian oath, uh, which is, is just about, uh, you know, doing, being honest, doing our best for the city. I mean, it, and it's not a, it's not a prayer. Uh, so many communities do that instead. So that might be part of the research that we do. And there's also biblical precedent in Matthew 6, 6, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So I, th well, I think God can... Both. I mean, I'm not going to argue that. I mean, it's taught both ways. Right. Does it end up dividing us more? I mean, I, 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 I appreciate two things. I sincerely appreciate that you said you could just pray as a mayor and not care, but that you wouldn't do that because you value the co collaboration and the cooperation that we have here. I, I appreciate that because I think we all have a sense that that would just, that would do so much destruction to our collegiality. And I also, I really appreciate Joel, that you feel like this is coming from a spiritual insight, that you feel driven to do this. I, I, I want to honor that. And it, and it helps me to see how sincerely disrespected it must feel to you. <clears throat> I just think it, you're a good man and you're a good Christian. And and if we voted no, you would still be a good man and a good Christian, and we could still be good people, too. And I, I hope... I don't think there's a question on... I mean, all of us sitting up here are serving our community. I don't think there's any doubt that we're doing what we what what's good for the community. Well, I, because we know each other. It's, it's like going back to that book, right? We have relationships with each other. We know each other. And, and so we know we can disagree and still care about each other. It's, it's how this gets purported out to the larger community and what can it do to the larger community that, that concerns me. I don't want this to turn into a big 
prayers versus non-prayers in Fruta topic that hits the media because that doesn't do anything to try to bring us together. And and I'm I'm fairly certain there are about as many people in Fruta who would be opposed to this as there are people who would who would be against it. So as leaders, it's our role to try to figure out how do we bring our how do we bring ourselves and our community together around this. Well, and, that, and what I don't want this to become is oh we get a new council or we get a new mayor and now oh we're I mean it's like this this two year term we're not doing it this two right. year we're not, we are doing it right you know that's what I don't want to see right. I mean, that can happen either way. I mean, that's that's the truth. You Correct. Know, it, that's not anything that we have really control over is, you know, for me, uh, six months from now, I have no say in the matter. Um, we can't find future counsel. So, right. um, so do you feel you will have disappointed your God if we land on a moment of silence? No, because my God, I don't think... We disappoint him every day. I mean, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we're a sinful. I mean, we're sinful in nature. So it's it's not a matter of that. And it's not, it's to me it, it's not a matter of. Um, it's just an impression that's put on my heart that hey, this is the right thing to do. When you step out in faith, part of that is you have to listen. And so this is one of the things I'm feeling like he's saying, you better listen. There's been lots of times in my life when I haven't listened or haven't been obedient to the things he's asking me to do. And so this is one area where I really feel impressed upon that it's important. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Yeah, I get that. I so if I don't do this, then yes, I'm, I'm, I, I can't say I'd be disappointing him. It'd be more or less I've, failed to step up to the, the challenge he's given me. No, but you didn't. You brought it forward. You, you just don't control the, the way the vote goes. Correct. That is correct. So I, I appreciate to reiterate what you've said. It, it, this has also been very open and vulnerable on, you know, on everybody's part. This is not an easy conversation because it's such a personal matter. So I do appreciate the way that you've presented <clears throat> showing us kind of where you're coming from at least me well it seems like a a good compromise to do the moment of silence uh, silent reflection and just do it at each meeting and just do it at what i didn't catch the last words at each at, meeting and oh, just each do meeting. it at, at each meeting So the other side of it is, and and I know uh, Mike talking to Mary Elizabeth, he portrayed to me that we don't have to take a vote on agenda changes, um, that we can do that at workshops or whatever else. Me personally, um, if we're willing to say this is how we stand, I want a motion and I want a vote. It's what I'm asking for too, because I want to know that everybody's willing to go on record to say, hey, this is, you know, what we believe in. And I guess we've got on record tonight our conversation, but that's where I was coming from too, because I felt like at that meeting, it was kind of like, oh, let's do it at a workshop and let's just, you know, get it done when it's not on public record. And that's why I wanted to bring it up at this meeting tonight. I feel like requesting that we have a vote to put it on record for a procedural matter is divisive. I mean, you know where we all stand. We've already made a decision as council. We have another council coming up that can change the direction that the council goes, change the procedure, and asking us to put forward a vote on it. It just, I don't know, it just seems seems divisive to me. I disagree because I don't, I disagree because I don't, I don't, if I'm going to say something, I'm going to put my name behind it. I don't have a problem with that. What I would ask is, if the talk in the community gets turned to, you know, if you're talking to someone and someone's saying, oh, that O'Brien, she's a godless, terrible devil woman because she voted no for prayer, that you have the courage to stand up for me and say, no, I know Heather, and this is what I know about her. And I promise you, I would do the same for you. And I, I will guarantee you that I will do that. Yeah. So uh, my question is then, what's the point of the vote? 
point of the vote is I, I feel like we vote on stuff that happens and Mike might be able to, or Mary Elizabeth may be able to answer that. There's no requirement saying that we have to do it. That's my thing saying, hey, you know, like what Heather said, if you're willing to say it and you're willing to stand behind it, I mean, we make tough decisions all the time up here. So why is this any different? It's a tough topic, tough conversation. You know, my deal is, are you afraid to say, hey, I'm putting my name that this is the way I'm voting? That's that's well, well, Joel, my my point is we've all expressed that. No, I do not believe that prayer should be in our meeting. But a moment of silent reflection, I totally support. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering. So from this vote. What what are the next steps? Well, what I'm hearing you say is that you'd make a motion to that we'd have a moment of silence before each meeting. Is that correct? I could do that, yeah. And then is council on board with that? Mayor, if I could, do you, mind, do you want me to just clarify what? Yep. Go ahead, Mike. mentioned yep. a couple of times, but so I received a couple of questions from uh, a couple of you related to uh, this topic and so not obviously this is a up to its council discretion but talking with our city attorney and Mary Elizabeth can chime in if I if I if I miss anything or, or, or say anything wrong but um, just as a matter of procedure that the city charter has a section and it's 2.08 that's rules and record and the council shall make its own rules and order of business so I mean it's very a very simple statement. And that's anything that's not that's that's any procedural matter right if we're voting on ordinances and laws public hearing all these things are required, there are very specific laws and statutes, whether it's a legislative hearing or a. Uh, quasi judicial hearing we had one of each or we had both of those not one of each but both of those types of hearings uh, tonight. And there are very specific laws that, that are, are that deal with that simply the procedures of a meeting the order of the agenda you want to have you know, public comment at the end, at the beginning, all those things are up to the current council. They're not a matter, um, as Mary Elizabeth uh, shared with me, they're not a matter of citizen initiatives. They're not a matter of ordinances. Um, very, uh, very difficult to have laws that are created that dictate a procedure that is given that the, the charter gives the council the ability to amend. A good example would be just the time limit of public comment, right? That's another procedural matter. Council can determine we want to give three minutes, we want to give more than three minutes that and you know, and it's posted ahead of time so people have have the knowledge of what that is. So whether so the difference between voting on procedural matters and voting on other things that require a vote is is simply the fact that um, you're, you're giving direction on a procedure that is then posted publicly ahead of time on what that procedure is. That's the notice. That's the uh, of what that is. So, um, you know, so it's it's uh, appreciate that you all are having a very open conversation about it. Just wanted to clarify procedurally that's um, the council has the ability to set uh, the procedures of the meeting and that can just be direction and, and ahead of time and it's posted in that agenda of how we're handling it. It even gives you the ability during a meeting to adjust and you've had to do that before maybe there's um, uh, ext extremely large amount of people and have to adjust you know how, how to accommodate uh, comment from all those people and, and those kinds of things so I know you're not talking about public comment I'm just using that as an example of procedure which is much different than an ordinance we have an initiative process where residents can you know put get do a ballot or, or get enough signatures to request an ordinance to council and then council has to act on it if they don't act on it there's enough verified signatures it goes to the ballot but that's not a matter of procedural matters that's that, that there's a difference in that and hopefully i've articulated that as mary elizabeth shared with me um, but feel free to uh, correct or add on Mary Elizabeth if you need to. Uh, no, I'll just say, I mean, Mike, that's that's right. That section 2.08 of the charter says that city council sets the rules and procedures for meetings. Um, and that is to just allow that flexibility because sometimes during the meeting, you've got to switch things up. You either have to, tonight, you know, you always ask, are there any changes to the agenda? You know, you might have to move things around. You might have, um, 
you know, want to give people more than just three minutes or give them three minutes during public comments for items not on the agenda. And when you get to the agenda item, give them five minutes a piece. I mean, there's flexibility there. Uh, you know, tonight on this issue, I, I do think you guys are having a great conversation, a very open conversation that um, is a difficult conversation uh, because people, it, it is a personal issue. Um, and I would, you know, you can have a vote if you want to, that doesn't like hurt anything. Uh, at the same time, it's certainly uh, not necessary. And, um, you know, I think you guys have certainly laid a uh, public foundation here for how each of you uh, feels and what direction you want to go. So, you know, uh, a vote certainly wouldn't add much to that um, since you've already set it out. I think you would want to at the end, it sounds like folks would like to take direction uh, as to a moment of silence. So I think if that's the direction you guys wanna go make that clear on this record. All right, thanks, Mary Elizabeth. Is there any other conversation on this topic? So, so, oh, the so question. what are we gonna do? Are we gonna make a motion <laughs> right. and vote? I don't know. That was a lot of information that I'm not sure. Well, the thing, well. It sounds like we can do whatever. Right. Okay. But staff needs direction on where, if we're gonna, because if it's posted on the, if we post it on the agenda as a moment of silence or do we just call for that? So how are you feeling? Or there can be no change. Or there can be no change because you were you were you didn't want to vote or didn't didn't feel like talked about this multiple times. Yeah. So he wanted to push it off to the next council. Kyle, where are you? I think I mean it based on what I'm hearing, what I think we should do is just uh, like honor the decorum of us coming together and talking about it, and we're talking about it. And, you know, if it wants to, if, if the future councils want to, you know, readdress this, this issue, then I think that's, that's fair too. I, I don't know that we need to make any sort of motion. I mean, unless somebody feels passionately about um, one of the things that's been proposed. Well, so several things have been proposed. And so I right. guess if staff right. wants direction, then we need so, to- I don't, I don't Right, right. I, I, I was just, I'll just chime in real quick. If, if you guys, so I think some, I can't remember who just brought this up, but I think if, if you, right now on the, on agendas that are posted, which um, are the way that you provide notice to the public as to, you know, what's happening at a meeting, right? And which is the information they use usually to decide whether or not they want to attend. Uh, right now, uh, the agendas don't say, you know, don't say anything, you, you don't start with, I mean, it starts with the pledge, I believe, of allegiance. And that's, you know, you don't have anything prior to that, whether it's an invocation, moment of silence or whatever. So options are, you know, give staff direction, just leave it as it is. Um, or if you guys wanna give staff direction uh, to add that moment of silence um, at the beginning, you know, on the agenda, you can do that. Uh, or you, you know, can put that on on the fly when you get to a meeting. So that's kind of, you know, that's up to you. But I think if you're going to, if you do want to make any change to kind of how the agenda is posted, I would just at least give staff that direction. It doesn't have to be a formal motion. Mr. Mayor, if you want to give staff direction to add a moment of silence, I'm okay with that. I mean, Super strong motion. No, I'm, just kidding. Well, no, I'm, I'm, just I'm kidding. not doing it within a motion, but it's up to the mayor has that discretion. I, the mayor doesn't make a motion, so. Well, but so we're but you can still I give direction. Give direction. I think if we're talking again, if we're saying, oh, we need to make the public aware of what, of what a meeting is being run, then I think we need to post it on the agenda. I'm okay with that. Do you want it every meeting? Do you want it every, how it was? So we have three meetings a month. It used to be. Well, we never do. We have never done those at workshops. So it was just twice a month. Twice. Okay. So do we want every meeting? Do we want? I'd propose for every meeting. Uh, I'm okay with that because it gives me, it, it gives me a second to change from my work mode into my city mode. And, and if, 
And if no one is there praying at me and interrupting my thoughts, then I can use that time. Not to labor and dissect this. What's interesting, I mean, we don't do the pledge at workshops. No. I had to go there. I heard the proposal as to just the two, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, but as to just doing the two public meetings of the, the workshops are public as well, but I mean the two council meetings. The formal meetings. For, the formal meetings, correct. Not not adding it to a for workshops. Correct. correct. Yep. Are you okay with that? Um, okay. You feel like are you party. making a motion? I am not making <laughs> okay. a motion. I know you, <laughs> feel, like, staff you feel like we've already decided and then we're revisiting this and rehammering it out. And so, yeah. Can you, I, can you live with that? Um, I definitely can live with any of it. <laughs> I'll show up and do my job. <laughs> Don't say any of it. None of it? Well, because my opinion is different than... I could live with it. All right. That's what council wanted. Kyle? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. And Karen, we heard from you that you're okay with that? Yep. Yes. All right. All right, well, that's all I have on my council reports and actions. So unless there's anything oh, else. Were yeah, we Karen. voting? Were we voting? No, we no, were just. We're giving staff talking. direction. So the staff direction is a moment of silence at each formal meeting. Correct. So happened before after the pledge. Okay. And just wanted and, to be sure. And, and that's specifically posted on the agenda, correct? Correct, and Matthew's asking is it before or after? Usually it was before. All right, you have the right direction, Mike? All right, with that, it is, the time is now 8.36 p.m. We are going to adjourn.